I, I, I have a humorous list of uh, comparisons between Christmas and Hanukkah for you. You know, one of the things we're doing as we study through the apostolic scriptures is we're endeavoring to set the apostolic scriptures in their original Jewish context. So I thought maybe these, uh, these, this viewpoint from a Jewish person about the difference between Christmas and Hanukkah would be helpful in our quest in that regard. So, um, hmm? yeah. so uh, number one, uh, Christmas is one day, same day every year, December 25th. Jews also love December 25th. It's another paid day off work. We go to movies and out for Chinese food and Israeli dancing. Hanukkah is eight days. It starts the evening of the 24th of Kislev, whenever that falls. No one is ever sure. Jews never know until a non-Jewish friend asks when Hanukkah starts, forcing us to consult a calendar so we don't look like idiots. We all have the same calendar, provided free with a donation from either the World Jewish Congress, the Kosher Butcher, or the local Sinai Memorial Chapel, especially in Florida or other Jewish funeral homes. What would the Messianic version of that be? We all have the same calendars. Uh, from certain ministries. Jewish voice would probably be a, a primary one and uh, maybe some others. <laughs> Two, Christmas is a major holiday. Hanukkah is a minor holiday with the same theme as most Jewish holidays. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. <laughs> Three, Christians get wonderful presents such as jewelry, perfume, stereos. Jews get practical presents such as underwear, socks, or the collected works of the Rambam, which looks impressive on the bookshelf. <laughs> you want that for Hanukkah gift, hey? The books of Rambam? Four. There is only one way to spell Christmas. No one can decide how to spell, and then it has like five different spellings of Hanukkah. <laughs> well, hey, two Jews, three opinions, right? We have to have a variety of opinions on how to spell Hanukkah. It wouldn't be Jewish. I actually, I saw a picture of a church, of a church uh, billboard that said, Christmas, easier to spell than Hanukkah. <laughs> uh, five. Christmas is a time of great pressure for husbands and boyfriends. Their partners expect special gifts. Jewish men are relieved of that burden. No one expects a diamond ring on Hanukkah. <laughs> Six. Christmas brings enormous electric bills. Candles are used for Hanukkah. Not only are we spared enormous electric bills, but we get to feel good about not contributing to the energy crisis. Seven. Christmas carols are beautiful. Silent night. Come all ye faithful. Hanukkah songs are about dreidels made from clay, or having a party and dancing the whore out. Of course, we are secretly pleased that many of the beautiful carols were composed and written by our tribal brethren. And don't Barbra Streisand and Neil Diamond sing them beautifully? Yes. Eight. A home preparing for Christmas smells wonderful. The sweet smell of cookies and cakes baking. Happy people are gathered around in festive moods. A home preparing for Hanukkah smells of oils, potatoes, and onions. The home, as always, is full of loud people all talking at once. Nine. Women have fun baking Christmas cookies. Women burn their eyes and cut their hands grating potatoes and onions for latkes on Hanukkah. Another reminder of our suffering through the ages. <laughs> Ten. Parents deliver to their children during Christmas. Jewish parents have no qualms about withholding a gift on any of the eight nights. 11. The players in the Christmas story have easy to pronounce names such as Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. The players in the Hanukkah story are Antiochus, Judah Maccabee, and Mata whatever. No one can spell it or pronounce it. On the plus side, we can tell our friends anything and they believe we are wonderfully versed in our history. <laughs> uh, 12. In recent years, Christmas has become more and more commercialized. The same holds true for Hanukkah, even though it is a minor holiday. It makes sense. How could we market a major holiday such as Yom Kippur? Forget about celebrating, think observing. Come to synagogue, starve yourself for 27 hours, become one with your dehydrated soul, beat your chest, confess your sins, a guaranteed good time for you and your family, tickets a mere $200 per person. Better stick with Hanukkah. So there's a... Um, there's a Jewish perspective on Hanukkah and Christmas for you. I noticed they did leave out a couple of the pluses about Hanukkah, things that I really appreciate. If you want to open your scriptures to uh, Paul's letter to the early Messianic community in Rome, we will just look through this passage. I have a couple thoughts that I wanted to share, and uh, we, can, we can contemplate some of uh, Shaul's message here together. 
So 4 verse 1, his very first thought has to do with a figure named Abraham, Avraham, whom we read about in the Torah. And notice how he describes him. He calls him Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. Uh, when Paul uses the term according to the flesh, that means physically. So whenever he uses the term according to the flesh, it means uh, on, a, on a physical level. Uh, for instance, there's a place where he references Israel according to the flesh. where he, He's talking there about Israel as defined by a physical, uh, f physical criteria. So this is interesting because Paul is writing his letter to a congregation of people. Some of them are from a Jewish background, but it's highly probable that the majority aren't from a Jewish background. And he's saying Abraham is our forefather on a physical level. So it's not even saying, yeah, Abraham is our forefather in the faith, or Abraham is our spiritual progenitor. He's saying Abraham is physically our forefather. Uh, that was a big question in the Middle Ages. There are certain Jewish prayers where you call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob your forefather. And the question was, can a convert pray these prayers with, with, uh, with integrity, with total honesty? Can a convert say, you know, blessed are you, um, Lord, our God, and God of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when this convert, for all you know, doesn't have a drop of, quote, Jewish blood in him? And uh, the, some of the great sages of, the, of that era said, yes, you can pray these prayers with a whole heart because you have been fully brought into the family. You are part of the family now. And uh, we hear this same idea in Paul's letters. And uh, I think it's an important one, even with the, the growth of the Messianic Jewish community, that there, there, there not be a great line of distinction drawn between people from a Jewish, ethnically speaking, background and a <clears throat> non-Jewish background. Paul says, physically, Abraham is our forefather. And that has massive ramifications on our worldview, our identity, how we uh, express our faith. Uh, check this out. In 4.12, he uses that same term. He talks about Abraham as the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, i.e., what did we learn? What does it mean if you're of the circumcision? Yeah. It means you're Jewish, either ethnically or you've converted and you're like halachically Jewish, you're legally Jewish, right? So he says that Abraham is the father to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So he calls him our father Abraham a second time. And then just to nail it home, in uh, verse 16, he says it again. And he even clarifies, just to make sure that we understand this important point in this letter. He uh, talks about how, uh, for this reason it's by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of some of us, of uh, the ethnically Jewish part of us. Now he said the father of us all. Now notice this, he's saying that regardless, irregard, uh, yeah, regardless of people's backgrounds, Abraham is your father figure. He is the father of us all. And that makes you his descendants. That makes you his seed. That makes you an heir of the promises that the Almighty made to Abraham. What were those promises? One of the hallmark promises of the Abrahamic covenant was that Abraham and his descendants would inherit the land forever. Who is, who, is the, who is like the ultimate descendant of Abraham? It's Yeshua. Yeshua is going to inherit the land of Israel forever. That's a picture of the Messianic era, Yeshua returning and inheriting the country of Israel. But if Abraham's descendants includes you and you and you and you and me, regardless of our backgrounds, then we should be factoring this into our futures. Prepare to live in Israel with the Messiah in the future, if you are a descendant of Abraham. So that's a happy note, hey? No more freezing cold winters. No more minus 40 winters. I'm, I'm prepared for like a mild Mediterranean climate, personally. This is your birthright. I, I don't know if believers realize this. Like, this is our birthright. The land of Israel is promised to Abraham and his descendants forever. This is your birthright in the future. Uh, like often in the body of Christ, we say, well, you know, the Jewish people, the land of Israel belongs to them, and that is true. 
We affirm that. But according to Scripture, that promise includes more than just the physically Jewish people. I'm just, I'm just reading Paul here, right? This is, this, is a, this is a Pauline understanding. So, anyway, there's a look at our future. Um, in 4 verse 2, Paul talks about boasting. It's kind, of a th it's kind of a theme in these chapters. I don't know, how many of you are famous for boasting? <laughs> or, or bragging? You know, really, talking yourself up. Uh, I don't know, I, I think especially we Canadians maybe aren't very famous for doing that. But, you know, maybe in the ancient world, maybe in Rome, uh, maybe people were a little more prone to boasting, really talking themselves up. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're a resident of the capital city of the world, superpower of that time, maybe you would be prone to a higher level of patriotism or a, a, a more swelled ego. I don't know, maybe that even happens today in world superpowers. Who is to say? <laughs> but um, whatever the case may be, he's, he's talking about something here, about, uh, about boasting. And like, what, 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 is, uh, what does boasting come from? What is the root of boasting? It's certainly not a humble heart. I think probably pride. When you're, when you're proud of yourself, you're going to end up boasting about yourself. If you're proud of someone else, you'll end up boasting about that person. I think that's, uh, that's, that's better, being proud of someone else and boasting about them. You know, bragging up uh, someone that you're really proud of. Okay, so just, just holding that thought in your mind, look at uh, verse 4. He talks about, let's say that ha someone hands you a check. If that check is a gift, then it's a favor. And it's you, you will receive it in a certain way. However, if the person who hands you the check is your boss, and he hands you the check as your paycheck, you're going to receive it in a slightly different way. There may not be the same level of gratitude there. There may not be the same level of, like, overwhelmed awe or wonder. Like, if your boss hands you a paycheck, you're not like, oh, wow, thank you so much. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I put in my hours, I did my work, and this is what I deserve. I am entitled to this paycheck. And uh, this, is, this is Paul's analogy that he's using to help us understand the concept of justification. God hands you this check that says justification on it. God hands you this check that says, you are right with me. I am making you righteous to the core. I'm not just looking at you like you're righteous, even though you're a total mess and you love sinning. And I, I'm not just playing games. I'm actually reconstituting you as a righteous individual. This is a concept of justification, right? And if he hands you that, that justification check and you have worked for it, if you've said, oh yeah, right, you know, I've been doing all the, doing all the stuff in the Torah, check, 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 um, I, uh, yeah, you know, I'm entitled to this thing, right? I, I, deserve, uh, I deserve to be right with you because, hey, I mean, I've worked really hard on this. You know, that's the attitude. But if we know that we, like, have a totally messed up past, which we all have, if we know that we have willfully committed crimes against His Majesty's government, if, if we know that the only reason we are right with the Almighty is because He just is giving it to you as if, like, a gift, He's just bestowing a favor on you, it, it evokes a very different attitude in our hearts, and it causes us to live in a radically different way. And I wonder if that isn't kind of the heart of what Paul's getting at here. And I, I think this is actually a very relevant conversation, especially for those of us in the, the Messianic Jewish community. You know, we are doing, okay, so most, most people, let's say in the body of Christ, they don't think too much about keeping the law. Like, that's not generally a major priority for people, right? Like, going down the 613 commandments every day and making sure I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. Um, however, in the ancient Jewish world, that was true. That was also true of many believers, because many believers came from a Jewish background where their righteousness was entirely, was entirely qualified by their observance of mitzvot. So check, check, check. Every day you check your mitzvot, and that's your righteousness o meter. Um, on Yom Kippur, you're, you're tearing yourself apart because you break, broke a mitzvah last year and you don't know if you're righteous with God anymore. You don't know if you have that justification. And so people would come with this mindset into the Messianic community and they thought that's the way it continued to be. They were entitled to righteousness based on their performance. And uh, that's not a very fun arrangement. And it's bound to crash. And if someone does end up being successful in breeding their own form of righteousness through keeping mitzvot, they often turn into 
the most egotistical monsters you can imagine who think they're totally right, but who have cold hearts and who are mean and who are like Paul, who ended up persecuting the very giver of the Torah himself. So this is, this is the mindset that Paul is tackling, uh, contextually speaking. And uh, so, you know us. Some of us are returning to the Torah. We're beginning to do the mitzvot. And it's so easy to slowly slip into the mindset that my righteousness with the Almighty is based on how well I do the mitzvot or how many of them I do, or whether I eat pork anymore, or something like that, you name it, right? And, and what's the next step? If we begin slipping into the mindset that our righteousness with the Almighty is based on our behavior, then what's the next thing we'll do? We will maybe develop a little pride in us, maybe we'll end up kind of boasting, maybe just in our own minds, of course we would never boast out loud, right? But like, tell me the truth, you've boasted about yourself in your mind at some point in your life. I've boasted about myself at some point in my life, right? And you know, eventually it's going to start coming out. Maybe it won't come out as boasting. Maybe it'll just come out as like a really bad attitude. You know what I mean? Or maybe it'll come out as judgmentalism. You know, I'm doing all these mitzvot and that person isn't doing all those mitzvot. Therefore, I look down on that person or I cannot accept that person as Messiah accepted me. Or uh, I no longer see that person as a brother or sister in Messiah. That person is them over there and we're us. You know, that person is that person over there and I'm me and uh, never the twain shall meet. Um, th those are the kind of attitudes that are quickly bred by justification by works. Now, having said that, I do affirm that the Torah is eternal, that Yeshua, Yeshua observed the whole Torah, and he left that as an example for us, and I believe that God is calling us to return to incorporating his commandments in our, in our lifestyles and our behaviors, but we don't do it to be right with God. Paul is saying a righteousness uh, has been revealed apart from the Torah. We read that in Romans 3.21. But now apart from the Torah, righteousness, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So everything in the Torah points to this, this righteousness. Everything in the prophets points to it. But you don't get there through keeping the law. You get there through what? Faith. Faith in what? Yeah, an issue is salvation. I mean, man, I don't know about you, but like that really sets me free when I realize that the only reason I am in a legally justified state, I've been exonerated from my crimes, is because God loves me and he just wants to write me the justification check as a favor. Wow, I do not deserve it. I am not entitled to anything. I have never done anything to make myself righteous, and I will never be able to do anything to make myself righteous. That leaves us a humble people. That leaves us a grateful people. That leaves us a people who just feel this overwhelming debt of love to a God who would show us such a favor. And maybe we even feeling we maybe we even end up feeling an overwhelming debt of love to the people around us too that God has shown that same favor to. So that, that is our common ground. That is our equal fitting with believers in the greater body of Messiah. Maybe they're out to lunch when it comes to some of God's commandments. Maybe they don't even keep the Ten Commandments. Maybe, maybe every Saturday they're out there mowing the lawn or shoveling the walk, depending on the season, right? But this is what we have in common with believers who have accepted that justification. We've received that same free paycheck. Now, what's, 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 the, what's the call from there? The call is to begin doing the word of God. Now that you are justified, express that justification by living a righteous lifestyle, right? But do it out of love. Do it out of gratitude. Don't do it out of uh, egotism or whatever, eh? So I, I, I just think, you know, Paul. Paul was the, uh, he was Messiah's diplomat to the the believers who are coming in from the nations. And so the, the, the heartbeat of Paul is so important for us as people coming back to the Torah from the nations, right? It's like sometimes when people come back to the Torah, they really, oh, they wrestle with Paul and they're like, oh, I don't know about Paul. He says this thing and at first glance it just doesn't seem to line up with the rest of the Torah. And oh, and my friends think they always quote Paul at me to try and get me to quit doing the law. You know, I mean, and some people are just like, don't talk to me about Paul. I just need to put Paul on the shelf for a couple of years. And uh, we want to be careful not to do that because the message of Paul is exactly what the Messianic community out here in the diaspora needs to hear. It's going to keep us balanced. It's going to keep us healthy. It's going to keep us sane. It's going to keep us from getting all wonky. 
And uh, man, I have seen instances where people like lose touch with the heart of Paul to just know Yeshua, to realize what he has accomplished. And we just like, we become a bunch of spiritual dingbats when we lose touch with that, with that priority. So, um, so anyway, hopefully we're just kind of like looking at Paul's writings here and um, getting something out of it on a practical level. Uh, moving on, in uh, Romans 4.13, by the way, okay, I'm using terms like dingbats and wonky here. Um, I'm not referring to anyone here, okay? Just so you know. I'm just referring to our human tendencies to be... I, I, am, a, I am a spiritual dingbat aside from Messiah, okay? I am totally wonky aside from like the full counsel of the Word of God. So I'm talking about myself here, okay? I'm not talking about any of you guys. So if I'm ever getting a little wonky, just say so, okay? <laughs> okay, so uh, Romans 4.13, let's just keep scrolling through here, let a couple key themes jump out. Romans 4.13, um, returning to this concept of the promise to Abraham and to his descendants, which includes you and me through Messiah. The promise, what is the promise to Abraham? That he would inherit the land of Israel, right? That's what we always say. That's what it actually says in the Torah. In fact, the, uh, the boundaries are even given, you know, from the Euphrates to the, um, to the uh, river of Egypt, which includes large sections of some um, highly Islamic and very hostile to Israel countries right now. But, but, but get Paul's understanding here. Paul is building on this theme. He says that the promise to Abraham is that he would be heir of the cosmos, is the Greek term. The cosmos. The Hebrew parallel term is the olam. So the Almighty, who is the melech olam, the, the sovereign over the cosmos, the, the king of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the whole world, he makes this promise to Abraham, his friend, and to Abraham's descendants, that he would give him the whole thing. The whole thing. I wonder if that isn't why the enemy kicks and screams and digs in and fights when believers start understanding their identity, their covenant identity, in these ancient covenants, like the one with Abraham and the one with Moses. Because when you begin realizing that, you begin realizing that Mashiach is returning and he's going to inherit the cosmos and you are going to inherit it with him. And that doesn't leave a lot of room for Hasatan, does it? Like, that's the total eviction point. So all that to say, you know, this return to understanding the whole series of God's covenants, including the Abrahamic covenant, which Paul was very strong on. This is spiritual warfare we're talking about here. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes believers will get together and they'll see a problem, so they'll, you know, uh, shandala shandala and bind in the name of Jesus. And, uh, you know, there can be value in that. But I suggest to you that maybe we're just dealing with symptoms of spiritual problems when we're trying to bind little things like that. Maybe it's better to hit the root of the problem and to connect with the power in the Abrahamic covenant and to real, realize that you, in conjunction with Mashiach, you are an heir of the cosmos. So like this province, this is, this is your turf. This is my turf. We are inheriting this province alongside Yeshua because it is being given to him as a possession. Psalm 2, I will give you the ends of the earth as your possession. Saskatchewan, I think it qualifies pretty good as one of the ends of the earth. I mean, we're in the extremities of the globe here. You know what I'm saying? Like, Minus 40 winters. Really? So just, just remember that. Let that build your faith. That is, that is like a very high level of spiritual warfare. That is the peop Messiah's people inheriting like chunks of real estate and taking it for him based on their faith. And uh, that's the power in the Abrahamic covenant as I see it. That's the power in that promise um, that the Father made to Abraham and his descendants. Now, this is interesting too. Um, there's like Paul, he coins these terms and they're not used anywhere else in the scriptures. And it can make it, can make it very challenging to understand what Paul is talking about. Okay, he uses terms like works of the law or those who are of the law or being under the law. And uh, the, you can interpret those in a very wide, uh, very wide context. I mean, that can mean anybody who reads the Old Testament or has anything to do with the Old Testament. Oh, that person, they, they get something out of the Old Testament when they read it. They must be of the law, so they must be bad, right? It's like, no, of course, that's an extreme, that's an extreme interpretation, and I don't think anybody goes that far. But people do often take an extreme interpretation that's very similar. They say, oh, 
It's not, oh, that person ha finds meaning in the Old Testament, that person reads the Old Testament, but that person practices some elements from the Old Testament. They must be of the law, ch -ch -ch, right? And like kind of keep them at a distance. They must be dangerous. Um, that's kind of the often the pop interpretation of this term of the law. But I want to su su suggest to you that that is not a correct interpretation. Okay, here in, in Romans 4.14, he says, If those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise is nullified. So whoever these people are who are, quote, of the law, they uh, will not be inheriting the promises. Um, they are not, quote, like, they're, they're not based on faith. They're uh, probably based on this antithesis thing that Paul has, the, the whole works mentality. Um, in 4.16, Paul uses a different he uses the same term of the law, but he uses it in a totally different context with a different meaning. I want you to read this with me because this is really important. 4.16 he says, For this reason it's by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So did you hear that? In that verse Paul is saying, all of the descendants inherit the promise, including those who are of the law. So either Paul is like, having some serious issues with um, flip-flopping on his doctrine within two or three verses, or Paul is using two different applications for this term. Let's, let's have a look at this here. Okay, so 4.16 he says, um, All the descendants inherit the promise, it's guaranteed to them, those who have the law and those who have the faith of Abraham. So I think we could, assume, we could assume in this passage that he's talking about those who are of the law being people with a Jewish background who practice the Torah. And in this passage it's okay. That doesn't disqualify you from the promise. And he also mentions those who are of the faith of our father Abraham when he was uncircumcised, i.e. while he was quote, not Jewish. <laughs> Sorry, I'm totally reading that term anachronistically in the, to the packet, pa passage, but you understand, right? Okay, so backing up here, what does this mean then when he talks about those who are of the law who, uh, who don't receive the promise? What does being of the law mean here? Under the law, like this kind of? No. Who are, who are of works and not of faith? I, I, I kind of wonder if being of the law isn't, isn't equatable with legalism. Um, David Stern, uh, do any of you have David Stern's translation open? How does he render that phrase, being of the law? I think he uses a phrase like, you have it there? Verse six, verse, uh, actually verse 14, I think. Okay, so he renders that phrase as legalism, yeah. So I, I think maybe this is what Paul is getting. Paul is not against Torah observance, but Paul is against Torah observance with the wrong attitude or with the wrong intent when it becomes legalism. Oh. Uh, moving on, here's, here's a practical one. 4.17, it says, uh, As it is written, A father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even Elohim, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So Elohim does two things. He, he brings dead people to life, and he calls things that don't exist as if they exist, and he calls them into existence. Like, that's the power of his spoken word. And I wonder if he sometimes doesn't call us to imitate him in that. Now, I, I'm almost scared to touch on this because I, I think maybe some of us have encountered extremes in the form of the, what, what's the classic phrase for it, like the name it, claim it doctrine, or the whole thing where, like, if you think it, then it is going to... Uh, you know, if you're driving down the street and you are thinking, I'm going to find a par I'm going to have a parking spot, then the parking spot will be there. Um, you know, there's some very new agey concepts like that. I'm not talking about that. But what we see here is like Elohim creates stuff by speaking. Maybe he even brings life to the dead by speaking. And I wonder if he doesn't call us to a similar expression sometimes. Is, is it true that your words can bring life to someone's spirit? Oh yeah, words can be so life-giving. Or words can, words can cut someone down. It, it can, they can sap their life. It, it can be a, a very destructive thing. So what I, what I see here is like, on a very practical level, as this can apply to community, like, call, call things into being in someone's life, even if you don't see them. The character qualities of Messiah. You know, affirming someone in the righteousness in Mashiach. That is life-giving. That is copying the Almighty. That, that's a practical thing there. Um, 
I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example of this in my in my own life. Um, when I first felt that I received a vision from Messiah for producing our Hebrew lessons as a Hebrew course that would be available as a DVD set and as online lessons, I I felt in my spirit that we wanted to reach at least a million people with this thing. Like, that was what I felt. I want to reach 100,000 people with these classes, like directly. And, and I want to see those 100,000 people go on to influence at least 10 people each, long term. Maybe even in the next generation or two. That was what I sensed in my spirit. That, that's, a, that's a big goal. I was like, okay, Yeshua, like, I'm up for it, but that's a big goal. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I would be happy to work with you towards that, but really, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a nice size figure. You know what I'm saying? And uh, the question is, how do you... Okay, so that's, that's an example from my life. And I believe that the Father has a calling for each one of us. He has a vision that He wants to, to give us. And it's going to look different for each one of us because as members of the body, we have different functions. But He wants to set a vision in your heart. And it's not a vision that has materialized yet. It's not something that's come to pass. Just like the Father made a promise to Abraham. He guaranteed him that he was going to have a son. And it was like totally impossible. And uh, what was Abraham's response? Maybe we can look at that too. In, uh, in 19, this was Abraham's response. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So did you hear that? He was, Abraham was a realist. He wasn't like starting to play some stupid mind games and uh, playing make-believe. He contemplated on a very practical level, you know what, I am totally unable to procreate at this point in my life. And my wife, similarly, is unable to have children. Okay, so he was factoring that level of reality into this equation, but that's not the end of the verse. It goes on in verse 20 to say, yet, with respect to the promise of God, the guarantee of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So what are the two action points there? There are actually three. Okay, so with, with our father Abraham, you know, he received a guarantee from the Almighty. He, he was given a vision of something that had not yet, that didn't exist at that point in time. And uh, he did three things. First, he looked at his situation very realistically. He analyzed his current condition. He said, okay, this is where I'm at. Then what did he do? It says he, he, that, didn't let him, that he didn't let that shake him. He didn't waver. It says he went on to become strong in faith. How? By giving glory to God. I, I think that's one of the key points there. Giving glory to God. Uh, that, that is a verbal thing. To give glory to God, you need to verbalize something. It could be in the form of, of, of uh, giving thanks to him. That is giving him glory. Uh, it could be in the form of praising him or even praising him to other people. Saying like, praise God. Do you know how great he is? Do you know what he is capable of doing? That is giving glory to God. That is what our father Abraham did. And what was the third thing? He remembered a key fact. He remembered that God can do it. What he had communicated to Abraham, he was fully capable of performing. So whatever the vision may be that the Father has given you, whatever vision he's going to give you, on the day he gives it to you, remember those three things. You can be a realist, you can look at your situation, but remember to give glory to him, to thank him for that guarantee, to talk about it to people in your life, and to remember that he can do it. Yeah, that, 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 is, that will make us cookies cut with the cookie cutter of our father Abraham in the faith. So, you know, with, uh, with me in the Hebrew course, what does that look like? I have a vision to ultimately impact a million people with the Hebrew course, God willing. I don't even know if I'll get it produced. I mean, it's all up to him, right? But this is the vision he's given me, and I talk about it, right? Like from the start, I've said, this is our goal with the Hebrew course. We want to impact a million people with this thing. We want to have 100,000 students in it. Maybe that's an example. It's like, even though you haven't seen it materialize yet, you'll talk about it. You'll verbalize what he's given you. So, you know, I'm not like going around delusional saying, yes, we're going to do this, but I'm saying, this is our goal. This is what we want to see, eh? So, uh, who knows what that'll look like in your life. But uh, that, that's an example from my life. In 5.1, uh, we learn that the term shalom is 
not a term primarily related to me and my inner peace or uh, my, uh, my, if I want to have a calm mind or whatever, that's not what shalom means. The primary meaning is a relational meaning. Shalom is something you have with somebody else in a relationship. So like if you're good with the Almighty, then you have shalom with Him. If you uh, are not talking right now, if you're having some problems in your in your rapport with him, then you don't have shalom with him, is uh, I think kind of the idea. So just remember that. Every time it talks about shalom, when it talks about pursuing shalom, like being intentional and aggressive about going after shalom, it's talking about relationships there. It's talking about shalom and relationships. And I mean, really, like that's the last thing we want to do, right? I mean, okay, so Genevieve and I, how long have we been married? Like um, three, and, three and a half years or something? And... I mean, like, really, you know, in any relationship, including marriage, you, you hit to this point where you're like, this is hard. It, it has its challenges. I, uh, what, 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 what's our first human response? I think our first human response is like, I want to give up. I want to walk away. I want to whatever. And I mean, every single pe person feels that in relationships with other humans, right? And, uh, and we can just hear the Father's call saying, pursue shalom. Like, don't give up. Go after it. Just like uh, the armies of Israel, you know, Canaan is your inheritance. This is the territory that I've given you. There are giants there, but don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't freak out. Go for it. Be strong. Be courageous. Even though there are giants, even though it's going to be some tough slugging, you know. And you know, that, that, that's true of any relationship. That's true of doing community. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going we're gonna to hit times as a community where we have to work through stuff. We have to talk through stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm inferring that because as far as I know, we're all human. <laughs> you know, as humans, we all have our messes, right? So um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. That's, that's going to be a good thing. Okay, verse 2 tells us what we stand in. We do not stand in our observance of the Torah that does not cause us to stand. We stand in His grace. And hopefully His grace will result in us obeying Him. But it's His grace that causes us to stand. So like, if a community of disciples loses touch with the grace of God and the practical ramifications of His grace, get ready for that community to topple or splinter or fall apart. Because we stand by His grace. That's been a big theme for me. I don't know. Like, I pray every day, Father, like, I want to know your grace. You know, I, I, want to, I want to receive the fullness of your grace. Like, I'll take all the grace you have for me, Abba, you know? And uh, let's continue praying along those lines. It's the humble who get the grace. And man, I mean, the moment we, as individuals or families or communities, we lose that humility, the grace goes out the window and we go splat. And uh, don't ask me to... Uh, Explain what going splat looks like. You can, you can, uh, you can just, you can, you can envi envision that one yourself. <laughs> um, five nine. Here's another really practical one that's going to be relevant to your future and mine. It says, "Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him." So next time someone, let's say you have someone who's really evangelical, maybe, uh, maybe a co-worker, and they don't know whether you're a person of faith, and they say, so, uh, so are you saved? Tell them you're not saved. Say, no, I'm not saved. But then, explain to them in uh, Romans 9, see, it says here that um, I'm going to be saved from the wrath of God through him. I'm, I'm just joking. Don't tell them you're not saved. Of course we're saved. But, 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 but just think about this for a second. Often we have this mentality. Okay, you know, ka-ching. I, I, I put in my faith. I go to my salvation ticket. I got it in my pocket. I'm saved. You know, check on that one. Let's move on with life, you know. And then you walk through life saying, yeah, you know, I'm saved. It's done deal. And I mean, yeah, we do have salvation in Messiah. But what Paul's saying here is, you are still going to experience more salvation. Like, what's the wrath of God uh, I suppose, like, you know, uh, Sheol in the afterlife or after the second resurrection, that would definitely be the wrath. But what about his wrath on planet Earth? Um, do we ever see instances of his wrath expressed on planet Earth as judgment, not only on individuals, but on cities, on countries? Yeah, for sure we do. His wrath sometimes falls on whole nations as judgment. 
And I wonder if that isn't what Paul is talking about here. That's really reassuring. Like, in the event of global catastrophe, in the event of national crisis, let's say like biological warfare hits a city near you or whatever, and the populace is freaking out, that could be an expression of the Almighty's wrath. That could be a token of his judgment on a country. I'm not one to say, right? But it, there seems to be this trend in the scriptures. But what we see here is he says, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So uh, some of those events in the book of Revelation that are coming down the pipe, uh, what would be an example? It says like with, with death, when death and Sheol are unleashed, I think it's the fourth seal if I'm not mistaken, they take out a fourth of the planet. Now you could read that in one of two ways. That could be like a quarter of the earth's six billion plus people going into extinction, which is like 1.5 billion people right there. Or it could mean like uh, a fourth of the world's uh, earth surface, so maybe a continent, maybe uh, Asia or Europe or Americas or whatever. Uh, however you read it, like that's some serious devastation. That is the wrath of God. And Paul says, your salvation isn't just something for the afterlife. You will be saved from the wrath through Yeshua. And then later in Revelation, it says another third of the planet gets taken out by the, uh, that army of 200 million from the east. They decimate a, like a third of the remaining world population. Um, if there are 4.5 4 billion people left, how much, how much is a third of that? That's another 1.5 billion. That's like half of the world's population gone before Yeshua's return. I, I hate to think about that, honestly. Like, heaven have mercy on all of us as a human race. But uh, this is what the book of Revelation says. This is some of the stuff that's going to come down the pipe. And I, I personally, like, I don't want to be taken out by the wrath. Like, I want to I live. I want to stand by his grace. I want to see the return of Messiah. I want to stand there with my family as a testimony of Yeshua's salvation and, like, welcome him back. I want to be part of that red carpet welcome. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, that's, that's my personal aspiration. And uh, maybe, maybe Paul's talking about some very practical things about being saved in the future from some very concrete expressions of the wrath of God in the end of days. I mean, I'm like, I'm thinking tentatively about some of these things, right? So. <laughs> 517 also uh, is about you and me. It's about our identity. It's about our job description. He, uh, he says, uh, if, the trans if by the transgression of the one, death reigns through the one, much more, those who receive the, the profusion, the abundance, the overflow of grace, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Yeshua the Messiah. So uh, here's, his, here's where he described you and me. Like if we have received Abba's grace, then our destiny is to reign in life through Yeshua. What does it look like to reign? Like we live in a dem democratic country. We do not have a king that reigns from his throne in his palace in the capital city of the, of the, of the kingdom, eh? Um, this, like, I, I think we don't understand this term. In, in Rome, there was a palace where Caesar sat, and he reigned over the entire empire. That was, that was a position of great authority. That dude called the shots. Like, he, he said what happened and what didn't happen, right? That, that's the concept of reigning. And Paul is saying, this is your future in Yeshua. In life. Reigning in life. So, um, like the whole concept of royalty, I don't know, I, I kind of like this. You know, there's kind of this fairy tale dimension that I think children especially like where, you know, if you're a girl, you're a princess. And if you're a boy, maybe you're a prince or you're a knight or whatever. You know what? Those fairy tales may be closer to reality than what you think. That may be what you are called to in the kingdom. Like, think about this. You are a princess in the kingdom. You are a prince in the, ki you are a prince in the, in the kingdom. You, you have already begun to reign with Yeshua, God's anointed king. That means you are called to express that. You are called to see the will of God implemented on planet Earth. How do we do that? Maybe through prayer? Do you think prayer would kind of be the key action point here? I think so. So remember that. When you are praying, you are not just praying and like wallowing in your sorrow or like trying to keep from glubbing under the water. Um, 
you're not just struggling in prayer. You are reigning in life with Yeshua. That is the heart of prayer. Like when we're talking about intercessory type of prayer, right? There's communion prayer when it's just like lovey lovey with Abba and you know, there are different kinds of prayer, right? But like this is a very critical aspect of prayer that maybe the Father is calling us to grow in or break out in or, or realize that this is, this is your birthright. Man, we're going to like, we're going to turn the city upside down for Yeshua. We're going to turn our province and country upside down for Yeshua. When we begin realizing that like, this is, this is who we are. we are. We are ruling with Yeshua right now in the life of the Spirit when we express that life through prayer, through loving each other and stuff. Yeah. So, all that to say, like, don't let the world around you define you, define the world around you. Because you are, you are a ruler with Messiah. Let, let's look at uh, chapter 6 for a moment here. Paul talks about a uh, union with Mashiach and uh, the practical ramifications of it. In uh, 6 verse 3, he says that you have been immersed into Messiah Yeshua. That means that you have this deep union with him. And I don't claim to understand this. This is something on a spiritual level. This is like Paul was something of a mystic. He's talking in, quote, mystical terms, if I could use that word without making anyone think I'm weird or getting weirded out. But just think about this, like, what does that mean? And then he begins working out the practical ramifications. So when Yeshua died, you died. Think about that for a second. It's not that you're going to die, you already died. When Yeshua died, you died. Like, over, kaput, finished. Like, no more. That was, that was the end of you. And when Yeshua was raised from the dead, you were raised with him too. It's like you, awoke, you woke up in Yeshua when he awoke from the slumber of death. And when the Father exalted him to his right hand, you went up with him too. Like, however that works, that's where we really are. Like, our earth suits are here on planet earth, right? We move around and we like, you know, we, give, we, we keep putting fuel in the earth suit and, and um, putting, putting things on to keep it warm enough so it doesn't shut down on us, right? But that's your earth suit. That's not you. You are living in your earth suit right now, but where, where is the real you? Where are you right now? Like according to Paul, you died, you were raised with Yeshua, and you're with him right now. You are in him right now. So that, like, that means there's a lot of Yeshua in this room right now. I, I don't know, like, Paul lived on a level that I just don't feel very in touch with sometimes. Do you? But it's like a level that I, I want to go there. I want to know what it means to be one with Messiah, to, to see the world through his eyes, to, to see my brothers and sisters in Yeshua. Like, I don't know. Um, okay, have you ever encountered someone in love, or maybe it was you, maybe you had a major crush on someone, or you were really in love, and it was like everywhere you went, you were, you were always with this person, even when they weren't really there? Every face you looked at, you saw this person. Um, I remember that. I remember when I was working in Israel. Um, there was this, there was this, this man in his 30s, and he was engaged to be married. And he was going to get married in like a couple of weeks. And he had been engaged for a year or something. His, his lady friend wasn't even from Israel. She was going to be flying in for the wedding. And he was so in love. Like, he would float around. He was in charge of our work crew. But, uh, I don't know, having like a foreman who was really in love and who was like always daydreaming about his girlfriend, it made from some really interesting work experiences. But the way he looked at me was what really got me. It almost freaked me out. I was like, you are totally not looking at me. You're looking at, uh, her name is Deborah. You're looking at Deborah right now. Like, he would look at me with this love in his eyes and tilt his head a little bit. And he'd be saying something about whatever I needed to do with the, 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 uh, the orchard that we were working in. And I could tell, like, he, I was like, he's saying this way too affectionately, right? But, like, just think about that. When we're in love with Yeshua and when we're living in his love, like, all we see is Yeshua. It's like we're always talking to him, even when we're not talking to him. You know, and I, I, I want to find that first love again. I really do. I, I want that fire of the love of God to be rekindled in my heart, especially during this Hanukkah season. I, I pray that for myself. I, I pray that for you. I, I pray that for us as a community. Um, yeah. I'm just really happy that, like, we haven't reached the goal and there's nothing left. 
I'm so happy that there's room for us to grow, to uh, develop in our love with him, to fall more deeply in love with him. Now, I'll, uh, I'll finish our, our contemplation on this passage from Shaul's letter in uh, 617. He mentions the Torah. He says, uh, Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. What was it? What's the Hebrew word for teaching? Torah. That's right. So he's saying that you became obedient from the heart to that form of Torah to which you were committed. It's just cool to think that, yes, the early Yeshua movement was committed to the Torah, but they had, they had a, a, their own version of the Torah. I'm not saying they went and rewrote the thing, but like, you know, there was a traditional Jewish version, and then there was like a version of the Torah as interpreted through the New Covenant, as, as practiced in the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. That's, that is our form of the Torah also. And uh, I, want to, I want to stay strong in that. Here I'll share with you a traditional quote that, oh, ouch, that really, that really like illustrates that point. He, he goes on to say, speaking about like sanctification, the outworking of, uh, of, our, our, of our, our justification. I should just look at my notes so I can remember what verse it is. There we go, 6.19. Um, Romans 6.19, he says, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, you used to give over uh, your body parts, the members of your body, as a uh, Slaves to impurity. That term impurity is defined by the Torah, by the way. That's like being in a state of impurity. And to lawlessness or torlessness. So, you know, you used to like, you used to give yourself over to this stuff, resulting in further lawlessness. So it would only breed more torlessness in you in a dirtier state. So now present your members of slaves to righteousness, resulting in what? Sanctification. So did he say you have sanctification or did he say that when you serve God and you do the stuff he says, that results in your sanctification? Yeah, so it, it's another example of how like Yeshua is your sanctification and yes, you are sanctified, but now live it out, right? And uh, here, here's a quote for you from Pirkei, Pirkei Avot. Have any of you ever read Pirkei Avot? Okay, it's, Pirkei Avot means like ethics of the fathers. It's basically like five chapters of Proverbs type material. It's like every generation in the Second Temple era had their own, their own sages, and every one of those sages gets a quote or two in Pirkei Avot. So if you could take a sage and like take his three best quotes from his whole life, and put it in a book, that's pure key of vote. And some of these guys preceded Yeshua by a couple of centuries. Some of them were contemporaries with the Master, and uh, some of them followed him by uh, a couple of generations. So um, here's an interesting quote from uh, a sage named Benazai. Benazai said, uh, run to perform even a minor mitzvah. You remember Yeshua referenced the idea of lesser commandments and greater commandments? So here's that idea. Run to perform a minor mitzvah and uh, flee from sin. For one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah and one sin leads to another sin. For the consequence of a mitzvah is a mitzvah and the consequence of a sin is a sin. Did you hear that thought? It's like what Paul is writing here is almost a mirror image of this concept. When we sin, it breeds more sin. When we do righteousness, it results in more righteousness. So run to perform every mitzvah. I had one Hebrew word that I wanted to share with you because it gives us a real insight into uh, what something's all about. In Genesis 38, 18, Okay, so Genesis 38, it's a really embarrassing chapter, right? It's like Judah, he was the patriarch of the tribe of Judah and of the Jewish people. Um, he was like one of the progenitors of the Mashiach. And, uh, here he is like patronizing a prostitute. Uh, it's embarrassing. This man had some serious issues in his life. Um, but there's something interesting about this, whole, this whole, uh, whole thing. One of the things that he gives Tamar as like a guarantee that he's going to pay her is uh, his cord. Genesis 38, 18. 
It says, uh, he said, uh, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that's in your hand. That would kind of be like him giving her his keys, his driver's license, and his major credit card, or like his, his birth certificate. I mean, you're talking about like, these are this guy's, uh, these, are his I, these are his major items of ID. And he uh, gives them all away to her. And then she disappears and he doesn't get them back. You can see why he would have been a little worried about that whole scenario. Identity theft, yeah. <laughs> right, and then, you know, they do turn up in, in a rather interesting um, situation. But this term here for cord is uh, patil. Everybody say patil. To, uh, to patal means like to twist. Uh, you remember naftali? It's the same root, naftali. She named him that because she was wrestling with her sister. And in that context, it's like wrestling is when like, you're rolling around on the ground and twisting around and fighting. In this, in this instance, though, the patil is like, uh, it's a cord. It's, uh, it's like something that is, uh, what's the word? I don't do a lot of, yeah, like, like strung together, twisted together into a cord. Now, the interesting thing is this is the same term that's used for these guys that I'm wearing right now. It says to give into your tzitzit, into your fringes, uh, patil techelet. Did you hear the word patil there? Uh, so the, the, uh, the color is techelet, and also like the, the dye that it's made from, and this is a patil. So this is like a cord. It's something that's uh, twisted together, right? And it has the connotation of wrestling, which is interesting, because what does the name of our nation mean? To wrestle, yeah. And this is also something that Judah was toting around. So all that to say, the whole mitzvah about um, wearing tzitzit, whether you wear them on a regular basis or maybe you have them on a tallit, like a prayer shell, just remember that those are to you what that cord was to Judah. That is your identity tag. That identifies who you are, your place in society, who you serve, uh, which company you work for, etc. So, you know, if you could take these, you could just kind of, you could apply each of those questions. Uh, this says who I serve. This says who my employer is. This says which community I belong to. This says a lot of things. So that's, that's kind of the broader meaning behind tzitzit. Like, people today don't walk around with cords, right? Like, your cord isn't how you identify yourself in today's culture. So I wanted to point that out because it really helps us understand the cultural context of tzitzit. On, on the birthdays topic, I, I know a family that didn't celebrate birthdays and they had several children and I kind of felt bad for their kids, eh? Like, all their kids' friends had birthday parties where they felt special and they received cards and I don't know, these kids are like, yeah, I have religious parents so we don't do anything for me, you know? I think, I think there are different ways of celebrating birthdays. Maybe some that are better than ours. Like when I was growing up, we tried to make birthdays a special event where we would really make it meaningful. Like we would sit down and we would say, these are things that we appreciate about you. You know, these are strengths of yours and we would pray for that person on their birthdays. And uh, for a while we didn't even do the whole cake and candles thing. But that kind of, I think it kind of made a comeback because hey, I mean, I love cake. <laughs> well, as I see it, every, every Arab Shabbat is Mother's Day. Like, if, if people celebrate Shabbat, then every Friday evening is Mother's Day. Because that, that, that lady gets treated special. You know, her husband blesses her. Um, maybe her children rise up and bless her too, like it says or whatever. And so, um, as I see it, man, like, every lady should, like, want to see her family start doing Shabbat. Because she's going to get treated really good. <laughs> A little bit of selfish interest there, but... Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page, where you can make a one-time donation, or you can set up a monthly automated donation. 
I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.